behind that, can't you? Amen. It is paid in full. Now, today I'm going to Luke. Before I go to Luke, I've got to go over here to John. I'm going to Luke chapter 16. But before I read out of Luke 16, let me go over here to John chapter 8. Just think of that song that is saying, Paid in full. Paid in full. You remember what happened to the woman who was taken in adultery? She was brought before Jesus. The Bible said caught in the very act. And then the Lord uh, told the crowd in verse number 7, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And then, of course, they filed out. And if you'll notice in verse number 10, He said, Woman, where are those thou accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. For Jesus Christ to say what He said, He knew that one day He was going to pay her sin debt Himself. Now, I said that for a reason. Did you know there's a whole lot of people that think it's their divine responsibility to set everybody straight or to expose every little sin of every individual? And they want to keep that person down. They want to keep stomping him or her down so that they can't be used of God. So that an attitude of the people would think that there's no way that individual can ever be used. I'm here to tell you that John chapter number 8 said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I stand before you today because my sins are forgiven. Amen. It's easy for me to open the Word of God and preach because not only are my sins forgiven, but the guilt is gone. Amen. And if you're that individual, that some, and you know some people are wicked. Some people just have a nasty mouth on them. They have a nasty mouth, they have nasty thoughts on them, and they're trying to constantly put an individual down. My friend, let's not be guilty of that. Let's try to help people here at the Faith Baptist Church. Amen. Did you have people going to your church that did this, that did that, that did the other thing? What are we here for? What are we here for? Brother Gregory, what are we here for? To help people. Right. We're to try to get them from point A to point B. Try to get them to understand who Jesus Christ is. And that the penalty for their sin has been satisfied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, that person can go to heaven. So you begin to pick and choose who you want to help. And I guarantee you, if you're a child of God, you'll be a miserable person. You help those that God sends to Amen. Amen? Now we go to Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. In Luke chapter number 16, this particular story, beginning in verse number 19, centers around the sad fate of a rich man. The rich man, of course, is not condemned because of any positive act against Lazarus. But because of the sins of unconcern and, un and neglect. Now, of course, his unconcern and neglect was enough to reveal a heart that ignored the will of God and the Word of God. That is simply rejecting Christ. Did you know you're condemned uh, of your own self? Let me prove that to be true before I read Luke 16 again. I said go to Luke 16, but I'm going to go back to John chapter 3 just for a moment. John chapter number 3. And uh, listen to what the Bible says here in beginning in verse number 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Well, that goes right along with what we were saying a little earlier, doesn't it? The person wants truth, what's he going to do? He's going to expose himself to what? To the light. And the light's going to cast truth on his evil deed. You know what he's going to do? That person's going to change his mind. He's going to repent. And he's going to accept the light. And when he accepts that light, what will God do? God will give him more light. God will give
give him more of the truth of the Word of God. But a person that does not want it, and for anyone to try to keep anyone away from the light, does not have light themselves. Self-righteous, lost, ignorant, mean people. I'm saying that for a reason. I'm saying that for a reason that every one of us ought to have a heart of gratitude and a heart of compassion try to help anyone that comes our way. Amen? Amen? Anyone. That's what we're here for. That's the church. We're to help people. Give out water in His name. And give the gospel to a lost and dying world. Amen? Back in Luke chapter number, uh, number 16. Luke chapter number 16, beginning in verse number 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good thing, and likewise Lazarus evil thing. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now again, we read that story. That's a pretty popular story. We understand we've heard it before. Uh, some people call it a parable. The Bible does not call it a parable. I think it actually happened. It's a real story. Based on the Word of God. Again, the story centers around the sad fate of the rich man. Rich man, again, is not condemned because of any positive act against Lazarus, but because of the sins of unconcern and neglect, and that was enough actually to reveal a heart that ignored the Word of God and the will of God. Now, God's Word reveals God's will, which according to John chapter number 6 and verse number 40 is this, that this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. So the will of God for everyone's life is that they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now the rich man had not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon. How do I know that? Look at uh, verse 12 of chapter 16 of Luke. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? The rich man had not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon that had been committed to him, so he could not be trusted with the true riches of heavenly treasure. And if you'll back up to verse 11, we'll read this. The Bible said, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now that's a principle throughout the Word of God. It cannot be ignored. It can't be denied. If you've been unfaithful with something, what makes you think you're going to get more? And that truth is found in Matthew chapter number 21 with truth. They asked Jesus a question. The scribes and the Pharisees asked Jesus a question. And Jesus said, I'll tell you the answer if you'll tell me first. Did the baptism of John, was it from God or was it from men? And they said, we don't know. And then Jesus said, neither tell you by what authority I do these things. Again, it's not that Jesus did not want to tell them. It's because they did not receive the first light that God gave them. 
If you can't handle what God gives you, don't expect more. Amen. But when you accept, receive what God gives you, then He will give you more. Amen? That's the truth. That is true principle. Whatever soever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You'll find that principle throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture. Alright, now the rich man again had not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon that had been committed to him, so he could not be trusted with the true riches of the heavenly treasure. Again, according to Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Alright, here we begin, begin back in verse number 19 with two men. We're talking about two men and two destinies. The two men. Here's two men who lived at the opposite extremes of the social order. We had one owning everything, possessed nothing. And we had the other owning nothing, inherited everything. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. The rich man, in verse number 19, the Bible said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Each and every detail of the description of the rich man endorses the fact that he was a very, very wealthy man. According to verse number 19, he was clothed in purple and fine linen. And this was a type of clothing worn by the high priest and it was most costly. And the Bible says that he fared sumptuously. In other words, he had feasts and banquets every day of his life. But then on the other hand, you have the beggar in verse number 20 and 21. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, more of the dogs came and licked his sores. The man, the beggar, was weak, he was sick, he was helpless, and he lay at the rich man's gate hoping that he would be able to glean crumbs that fell from the rich man's table that came out with the garbage. In studying the message, I read a story where in Bible days, in this particular time, where very wealthy people wiped their fingers on chunks, thick pieces, chunks of bread, which were afterward thrown away. And Lazarus, the hungry and the helpless, was uh, begging, hoped to be able to find some of them to quench the pains of his hunger. That's how poor and that's how helpless and hopeless the man Lazarus was. So helpless that the dog sniffed and licked his swords. Did you know that the rich man could have easily assisted Lazarus but he ignored him. Life was so comfortable that he felt secure just the way that things are going. And if we're not careful, we can feel so comfortable and secure in our way of life, in our riches, that we'll forget what we're here for. Amen? Amen. And that's to help people. Not only help them physically, but the most important thing is to help them spiritually. The possession of wealth can either bless a person or it can blind a person. Now, there was the two men, the rich man and the beggar. And then in verse number 22 through 26, we have two destinies. Now, in verse number 22, we look at the beggar. The Bible said that he died. In the book of James, chapter number 2, verse number 26, the Bible says, For as the body without the spirit is dead. Death takes place when the spirit leaves the body. But death is not the end. I don't know how many times in my ministry in the last 30 years that people come still today and ask the question, What happens when a person dies? Well, let me tell you, according to the scripture, what happens? A saved man goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hold your place there in Luke chapter 16 and go over here to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I'm surprised in a Bible-believing country, or supposedly a Bible-believing country, how many people in my ministry have asked that question? I had a fellow that I preached to about 15 years. 
And if you know anything about my preaching, we talk about death, we talk about hell, we talk about heaven, we talk about the hereafter. But as this man went up to the coffin of his dear mother, he looked at me again with tears in his eyes, and maybe it was just because he was so saddened and mourning so, but he turned to me and he said, Preacher, what happened to her? Where is she at? What happens to the spirit? Is there a spirit that leaves the body? Did you know the Bible said over here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, the Bible says in verse number 4, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that which that we uh, would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath brought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given us unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, because of this, in verse number 6, what does the Bible say? We're not only confident, but we're always confident. Knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then verse 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So according to the Scripture, for me to live is Christ, according to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, and to die is gain. When a saved man dies, his body goes to the grave, but his spirit goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ if he's a saved man. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he has some sort of veiling that's recognizable. We're not some floating sheets up in heaven. We're recognizable. According, God will give a body as he sees fit. And then we understand this, and I'm getting a little bit off the message, but we understand according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 verse 51, that at the moment of the trumpet sounds, that's the rapture of the church, that we're going to be raised, these bodies are going to be raised, and we're going to be changed, uh, how quick? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. One fellow said, how quick is the twinkling of an eye? And he just, I don't know if he made it up or what, he said, one one hundredth of a second. Is that quick enough for you? Amen, we're going to be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. So the saved man goes to be with the Lord. But now what happens when the lost man dies? According to what we have, the truth of Luke chapter 16, he went to hell. A lost man went to hell. He went to hell. And there's torment in hell. Hell, as some religions preach around Santa Rosa County, is not the grave. Hell is a real place. It's a place of torment according to the Word of God. Now again, the better die, but death is not the end. It's the beginning of a whole new existence in another world. And for the Christian again, death means to be present with the Lord. Now in verse number 22, the latter part of verse number 22, the rich man also died and was buried. Someone said this. They said, death is the great leveler. Now, the Bible said he was buried. And I'm sure that this rich man had a real elaborate funeral. He hired mourners. Now, it's not recorded whether or not the beggar was buried or not, but I'm sure that he was. But here's what I also wonder, if we can speculate. I wonder how long the beggar was dead before anybody noticed him sitting outside the gate. That's sad, isn't it? Nevertheless, he's gone. Good riddance. He's not trashing the place up anymore. But look here at verse number 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The beggar may not have had as an elaborate funeral as the rich man, but according to verse number 22, saints, shall be brought home not only safely, but honorably. Honorably. As the angels carried them in the bosom of Abraham. In verse number 22, the rich man woke up in a whole new existence. In another world, he woke up in hell. What a contrast that we have. 
here in Luke chapter number 16. One in torment and the other in Abraham's bosom comforted and protected. He was, and the rich man according to verse 25, was fetched from the pleasures of this life by death. Death was a great leveler. Now the rich man in torments. Just from this passage, we see several torments. The first torment is to see what you miss. The rich man saw Lazarus, but Lazarus did not see him. We know that part of the torment of hell is a pit of consciousness. In verse number 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. We're finding constantly begging for mercy. It's a pit of consciousness. It's a waterless pit, according to verse number 24, to the point that you wish that you just had one drop of water to cool your parched tongue. It's not only a waterless pit, it's a pit of fire, according to verse number 24. Very painful, burning, but never burnt up. And you can look elsewhere in the Scripture concerning the lake of fire. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 40, Mark chapter number 9, verse 44 and following, you'll find that the fire is never quenched and the worm dieth not. Did you know that at that day at the great white throne, God is going to give every lost person a body that can withstand <coughs> the fire of God? It'll never burn up. But the constant torment and misery of burning in a lake of fire for eternity. Falling and with your hands bound and your feet bound. Falling continually in a bottomless dark pit with flames all around burning you and people crying and screaming and gnashing on you with their teeth. You don't want to go there! Right. And you don't have to go there. Right. You can be born again. Jesus. See, it's impossible, according to verse number 26. It's a pit of remembrance. It's a pit of sorrow and violence. It's a pit of fire. It's impossible, according to verse number 26, to cross from one side to the other. Friend, your eternal destiny is settled here on this side of the grave. In Ecclesiastes chapter number 11 and verse number 3, if the tree falls toward the south, or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there shall it be. You make your decision now. And every one of you here today, under the sound of my voice, God has given you a mind to think, and you better get in the Word of God and answer some questions uh, that will satisfy your soul, because only Christ can bring peace. And that's where we find our answer. Did you know that being good is not going to get you to heaven. No, it's not. It's not said, you know, in, in, this, in this passage of Scripture in Luke 16, it's not said that the rich man was immoral. It did not say that the rich man was a blasphemer or an idolater or an infidel. Perhaps, and just perhaps, that this rich man attended synagogue on occasion. And if you'll notice, the rich man didn't drive the beggar away, nor begrudge the poor fellow any of the crumbs that fell from his table. But as long as he himself was satisfied, nothing else mattered. He loved himself more than any man on earth. He was a self-made deity who worshipped at his own shrine and never saw his need of a savior and the, consequ the consequences and the results were devastating. That's a sad scenario. You know, money is not evil. It's the love of money that's evil. To tell people they need Christ. You need Christ. I tell people everywhere I go, you need Christ. Someone came to me one time and said, Brother Roland, go tell Bill Gates he needs Christ. I said, I'll be glad. 
but I understand what he was talking about. You tell a man that's got everything, he needs something. I had, a, I had to overcome a fear up in Chattanooga. Um, very, very wealthy. You know, I found out, after I found out my father owns a cattle on Thousand Hills, and I'm a member of the most wealthiest family in the world anyway, but I had to overcome an intimidation. I, I had to. Very, very wealthy people. And so I, I, I went to the, to, the, to the richest, wealthiest section I could find in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as I would walk up these, and they had gates, of course, couldn't drive up. So I would go in and I would walk up this mile-long driveway and knock on doors, and you would be surprised at the responses I got. Most were what I expected. They open the door. Everything is in order at this house. We don't need you today. Things like that. But every once in a while, you get one that says, "Just tell me what you did." But you know, when we when we get so caught up in what we can provide ourselves, then we forget Christ. That doesn't have to be money. It, it could be. It could be. What's, what's holding you? What's stopping you? What's between you and God? If you say, I can't live without it, get rid of it. And you come to Christ today. You come to Him. Don't let anything stop you from seeing your need of a Savior. And the Bible says, of course, that we can seek Him while He may be found. And the Bible goes on to say in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 13, if we'll seek Him with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our hearts. The Bible promised us that we will find Him. We'll find Him in the very pages of life that we've been missing Him. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Get in the Word of God, and God will begin to open your understanding. You get in the Word of God with the right attitude. Order your conversation aright. And things will begin to come to your mind. God will illuminate that mind. And you'll see truth how that God became a man and went to Calvary and died in your place. All of your sins was taken and placed on the person of Christ. According to Isaiah 53, His soul was made an offering for you and God judged Him till God was satisfied. He'll let you into heaven if you believe. Amen. Folks, you can't get any simpler than that. Right. For the rich man, he went to heaven. Lazarus went to heaven. Two men, two destinies. Let me give you some food for thought as I close. Yesterday has gone forever. Tomorrow, I may be gone. But where? Number two. The rich man ended up begging louder than Lazarus. Number three. People in hell still trying to claim kinship to Abraham. But it's only after the flesh. Father Abraham, send Lazarus. You remember what the Jews told the Lord Jesus in John chapter 8? We be of Abraham's feet. We be in bondage to no man. Did you know people in hell still trying to claim kinship? It's not going to happen. Matthew chapter 7 records that as well. Matthew chapter 7 shows us that it's sad to shun Christ Jesus all your earthly life and then try to claim Him in hell. In Matthew chapter 7, haven't we prophesied in your name? And in your name cast out devils. And in your name done many wonderful works. He says, depart from me, workers of the day. I never knew. I never knew. There's another lesson, some food for thought. In hell, begging favors of those Hated and despised. That's a terrible place to be. The lessons we've learned today, let me ask you a question again. Yesterday's gone forever. Tomorrow I may be gone. But 
where? Have you trust in Christ for your service? Let's stand up. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Um, I'm, I'm the only one looking. I hope that everyone will, uh, will honor that. And I don't do this often, so 